Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one. We pay homage to the holy one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We pay homage to his teachings. That's what we're doing here. So I'm going to, uh, poor Damagavesi is stuck. He is stuck in Sri Lanka. Uh, it's very interesting, the, the politics, and they're having some times there right now. And the unrest, uh, the easy way to fix it is to turn off everybody's internet, sort of. And so they turned it off. <laughs> and he said this morning, I don't know when they'll put it back, but this is the beginning of I, we're going, you know, I think it's remarkable how leaders of worlds are playing games and all of us just sit out here and we're not at the table for the monopoly game. You know, it's not fair. I mean, we don't get to play at the board. They get to play at the board and do what they want. And they don't tell us what is going to happen. And this is a good example of, well, we'll just turn them off and then we'll go try to find them and catch them, I guess, whoever they are and whatever they're doing. Uh, but then it's inconvenient, isn't it? When you tell people that you can make money on the internet and an entrepreneur start a job, make money, and you're running a little business and they just get to go like that and lock it up and stop everything. But what can we do? We are just the ones that get to watch. But sometimes if we just concentrate, we can manifest rain on them. <laughs> just rain, rain clouds. And we can have clouds to follow them around and just uh, play with them that way. So I'm gonna go to the uh, share screen and I think I have this up. Let's see what's in here. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this um, where I, they also did a bummer to me, the small computer that I draw pictures on for you. I can't get in the computer. I can't remember the password because I've been on this one so long. And then the just to, to test me, the universe is just testing me, May. They're throwing me all these little games. They took away my touchpad on the new computer and told me I had to use a mouse. So I was used to touching the screen or touching the touchpad. Now I'm just using the mouse. So it's like one adventure after another. You can never say you get bored in the computerized error. Okay. This one started with a, a, a message to me, and this was actually in 2017. I have this very strong, hateful, dear sister came, or Reverend came in. I have this very strong, hateful feeling towards some people in my past. And this is very hurtful to me, but I just don't know what to do. I always feel the same way whenever I'm working with this person. And what happened was a long time back, but the feeling, it keeps on coming up in the same way to block me in life. And can you help me to unravel the situation? My thoughts are so hateful toward them. And I keep on saying to myself, I would never forgive them. And I wish them ill will. And how can I change these thoughts? And sometimes I think that there is no hope and I simply must give up. And then I tell myself, what is the point of doing meditation? If I will not improve because I have seen, I, I can't seem to forgive these people. Your thoughts and suggestions are appreciated. Thanks. Um, so originally this was in 2017. I had to go back and find some records about what this is about, but I gave a talk in answer to the request by M and then expanded it further and started adding to this over time because there were lots of other people, lots of other people who were having similar things. And it isn't always that you can take a person just into forgiveness. You know, if it's a person that knows nothing, and has no basis of foundation to work with, that you would just shove them in and do the forgiveness circle. You, of course, you can do the other kind where you just start forgiving yourself and sincerely forgive yourself. 
and forgive yourself again, and then try to let it go. But what the story that comes up about that kind of training, that were that that kind of trying to do it that way, it's not that it's bad. It'll make you feel good for a while, but it'll certainly come back on you because the cycle isn't complete, and it isn't identifying actually with how the brain is working and why it comes up and what has to be done in order to let it go out all the way. That's what's happening. That's the problem. And the first time I ran into the difference between just saying, well, may you simply need to forgive it and just think forgive instead of I don't like this person or I hate this person, think about forgive all the time. You just have to do that and eventually it'll stop, but it could take years and years and years to stop when instead, if you use the circle forgiveness, it really does help. But it wasn't the answer, like I just said a moment ago, to dive into the circle, um, the forgiveness circle that we teach, unless you have some basics about what everything is about. And this person was not Buddhist. And that was the issue to start with. So after thinking about a lot of it, and it ties into what's going on today too, this is kind of what came out of this. So first we start with a proposition. The truth of the matter is that most people believe everything is happening to us. And that's involved with what's happening to him too. But what if everything was happening from us? And if that were the case, one might change how they initially choose to look at their experience as it is happening from a different point of view. It seems like if we change the approach angle of this in this way that we see things even just slightly and retune our perspective, we might then adjust our intentions and actions that follow and this would change too. But what if that is true? Um, well, that might mean when we change our mind we could change our life. And this is an interesting proposition that the Buddha decided to number of years, actually six years, trying to figure this out. This is what he was doing. He was trying to figure out the answers to what he had seen when he went outside of the palace. And he wanted to really get to the nitty gritty from the, in the Four Noble Truths in respect to that. So the Lord went on a quest, Lord Buddha went on a quest, for those years to find out exactly what suffering really is. He had to start there because if you don't know what it is, you can't fix it. And he was very smart and he wanted to figure out the cause of the suffering in the human beings. He knew he had to. And then he then looked into how cessation of that same suffering could happen. So take a look at how he documented his findings in one sutta and go take a look here for yourself. When you go to MN 141 in the Satchivibhanga Sutta, and you just start reading the first few pages of the Sutta that is giving one paragraph to every part of suffering, and you begin to see how really you know, organized he was with what he taught and how he explained suffering. And remember, this is going back to a Sutta that's way before Abhidhamma. You know, this is where Abhidhamma came from. It came out of these texts. It's not like it was an isolated thing, but it was very, very detailed. And some of us who, um, you know, who know about Abhidhamma have investigated Abhidhamma. And some of us have come to an interesting conclusion. We believe when he went up and taught this to his mother with the devas in the deva realm, that the devas were ready to heal the complexity and their minds were at a level where they could handle 128 different kinds of feeling to work with instead of three. But we're not ready for that. And most of us only need to know about pleasant and painful and neutral feeling as a good example. As an example, they only need to know about those three in order to do the whole program of learning a meditation that can carry you down the path and can and get you to uh, relax and wait until the conditions come up right for cessation to happen and then experience the rebooting of the mind which is what i like to call it where it opens up and these are the different levels the different times they experienced nibbana somebody asked me the other day because i wrote something about 
uh, just like that. And I said, the first time you experience Nibbana is here. And he said, wait a minute, isn't Nibbana just Nibbana and there's only one? Well, that is a deception that we have come to that point. Nowadays, we think there's only one involved. There is one super mundane Nibbana, but then there are the eight experiences of Nibbana, that the, the seven of them that open you to Sotapanna, then Sotapanna fruition, Sakadagami, Sakadagami fruition, Anagami, Anagami fruition, Arahat, and then Arahat and fruition is really the super mundane one, the final uh, remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering. Yeah. So let's see if ever, it, if I pass this time a little bit when I'm writing this, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. You know, when I was doing this, I, I started, and we're not going to go through this whole thing, but we go through some of it, and then we can follow the recollections on the off weeks. We can follow those and see what else the monks do with those. I'm waiting to see what they're going to do, how long we're going to take to go through those. So here, here is the uh, next one. Lord Buddha Gautama was quite a historical figure. Now, this is me talking. He was a prince, well-educated, perfected in all his studies, and he was an activist in his own time. He was an entrepreneur concerning the subject he taught. At that time, about 550 BC or so, most mendicants were practicing from the assumption that if they caused pain for themselves um, in very many ways, they could open the mind and uh, become enlightened. And it didn't work in any permanent way to deny oneself sleep or fast for long periods of time or cause oneself extreme pain or deny oneself food. And he left us several accounts of this situation not leading to any state that would be worthy of noble ones. Here you go, Everett, here's one. See Mahasachika Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 36, read sections one through 30 for an account of his failure using this approach and the implications he recounted for his own monks with advice not to practice in this way. He was serious about this. He talks about it in other suttas about um, it's important to get enough rest, to get enough sleep, to get enough exercise, to be healthy and fit when you're going to do this in order to go through Nibbana that you can't, you can't go through like he was after he starved himself to one bean a day and things like this. He can't, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't, he couldn't even sit upright. It was impossible. And so in this same sutta, we find that the Buddha is recounting the very point where he discovered this was a waste of time. And after six years, he considered another way that led him to, into cessation. So he was able to experience the highest super mundane Nibbana. In the Mahasachika Sutta again in 36, go from 30 to 37, and that will show you precisely indeed that he found a way. And now we all know what he's talking about there when he, he's recalling the harvest festival, and he's talking about that basically ins, insinuating that they say that his nanny left him under a tree resting under a tree and resting under a tree is a big message here, resting under a tree when he fell into a jhana. So he fell into a higher state by being quiet and calm and relaxed and he fell into that state. That's one thing we point out in the practice. If you've been working really hard and sitting bolt upright like this, trying to make your spine straight, you won't get there because your spine has a natural curve. And because you need the energy that flows in your back and up over your skull and down across the front to keep functioning for you as part of the natural process. But people today are no different than people in the time of the Buddha. Today, we often meet up with unexpected challenges and very sudden disasters. And we long for situations. And then upon achieving them, we face very sad dramas 
that keep going a long time in uh, with no obvious solutions in sight that will be quick. The Buddha was not silent on these kinds of situations and recounted many of them in his texts too. Indeed, he found many ways for escape from daily life suffering by developing changes in our knowledge and practical actions in life. Feeling, feelings of greed, dislike, hatred, and aversion are historically very common for the human species. And our need to compete with each other and our ideas of becoming better than our neighbors need a reevaluation. Such selfishness and mind states block our happiness whenever they arise in life. And times can be very uncomfortable to live with. They cause us unneeded tension and tightness with anger, frustration, and depression as dis-ease in our life. But sometimes in the end, these feelings bring us the opportunity to learn some remarkable lessons as we struggle to learn how they work and how to manage them differently in the future. I'm a witness to this. I'm still here, even though my blood pressure went way up early this morning. <laughs> when I figured out this whole program I had put these people in was not going to work. <laughs> You know, and I had plans for the day. It was really funny. But in the time of the Buddha, one such lesson was learned by the son of the Buddha, whose name was Rahula. Now, once Rahula, who was the young son of the Buddha, was learning meditation with the help of Venerable Sariputta in the Buddha's meditation camp. And at that time, he was 17 years old. He was a monk and considering the idea of going away to teach on his own. And then one day the Buddha came to visit him in the place where he was practicing his breathing meditation. The Venerable Sariputta was coaching him at that time. And he, um, he heard Venerable Sariputta remark to, uh, the Buddha heard Ven Venerable Sariputta remark to Venerable Rahula, that developing mindfulness of breathing was remarked to, uh, while practicing the breathing meditation, the Buddha, re oh, this is all mixed up. It's actually, Sariputta said that to him. I'm sorry, remarked, um, uh, let's see if I can fix this too, remarked there, um, that it was a great fruit and great benefit because it revealed to us much information about the four great elements and how they could be of benefit to us whenever hindrances arise. And he then expounded on this lesson and explained the very, the Buddha expounded on this a lesson to Rahula and explained the very nature of each of the five great elements. So here you can go over to, um, Maha Rahulawada Sutta in number 62, sections three through 17, and you can read about five elements, which is basically talking about the earth, water, fire, and air, and space. And then he's giving him a lesson on how to use these elements. It's a really good spot to read when you're wondering about why are all these hindrances bothering me. Well, it's because you're so personally concerned about them that they come back for more to eat. But, <laughs> but basically, this sutta is showing, uh, was showing Rahula how he could use the elements by reflecting on them and how they're not concerned about anything. And they never get upset about any conditions as far as the earth, or water, fire, air, or space. So that's how you should be practicing. That's what um, he was talking about. And then the Buddha continued to advise, advise Rahula to develop meditation according to the Brahma Viharas. And this was the way to help people remove thoughts of ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion by developing loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity instead. And his father knew that he would need these strange in these strange countries where men needed to be tamed, he would need the, these piece, uh, this information. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
in the strange countries where men need to be tamed. And the Buddha was very clear about this. You go to the Maha Rahula Wada Sutta, you go to 62 sections 18 through 21, which will explain why he was advising his son to learn the Brahma Viharas and be able to teach them easily to the people. I wondered why he advised him in this way. Well, it turns out that he may have advised this for him because the roots of all possible greed, hatred, and delusion can be weakened and changed by using the Brahma Viharas practice. And research today tells us clearly that because of the neural plasticity, our flexibility and stamina of our brain, people can change at any age. And when one learns to take control of the power of the four realms of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity, and they learn to develop that power, and then he or she is also mastering the abandonment of and all the thoughts of ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion. And this one was already noted above, so I just stuck that in there, Everett. I don't know if I did that right or not, but you know, it's a repeat, you can repeat footnote. With the abandonment of those four unwholesome obstructions, the Brahma Vihara meditation removes all nourishment for all related kinds of arising hindrances. That's interesting. And so negative states will not only be removed, when withdrawing nutriment, but also positive states will set up new paths of wholesome states, or paths for, sorry. The, the old one, the old path, naturally, um, those ones, they naturally cease and the new one that arises and it stays ba based on usage. It stays as long as it's based on usage, it'll stay and it'll start to grow stronger in a very progressive way. So this is what they can see today in research with the MF, uh, M, mm, fMRI cameras that they've invented in the last maybe 10 years or so. They can actually see, and I have these pictures of the the brain and then the neural net and then the actual fibers that show you the neural pathways. It's amazing. And you can actually see if a person has a very bad habitual uh, behavior pattern where uh, they are stuck with anger management. You can see the thicker one and then you can imagine you start using loving kindness. It's just a tiny little footpath and it's gonna be very small to start, but the more you use it, the more that it will, it will actually keep um, stay, it'll stay and it'll keep working for you. So this is what it said, Rahula developed meditation on loving kindness for when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned then it says when you're using compassion, the cruelty will be abandoned, the joy, uh, any discontent will be abandoned, and with equanimity, any aversion will be abandoned. And it goes on to say, to, to develop the parts of the body in Satipatthana, for instance, memorizing the parts of the body, because when you do that, any lust will be abandoned. And we often give this to a person who is very lustful and having trouble with that in their relationship, we often try uh, to get them to memorize the parts of the body and do a recitation or recollection on that. Because if they do that, and even the part about death, then it calms the person down and it brings them back into balance. If they were way out of balance, they'll come slowly like this and they'll come to a balancing point for their personality. And, you know, I'm really pleased that I had an opportunity to help a few different people in relationships that were just really bad and not the not matched as people for long-term relationships and they finally um broke that apart and then they found good people and ended up getting married across the years and it's been fun to hear from them every once in a while like i'm so glad i did that if i hadn't done that 
I never would have had a relationship. So this is possible to really help people through recollection that way. Um, this reference is in the Rahulavada Sutta itself, this section here. And the Buddha taught this to his son because he wanted him to first learn how to remove the seeds of most hindrances, because those four items seem to be the seeds for all of the, the ones that come up that bother you. Uh, those, if you look back and, and see what it is, we're talking about building a chart and saying, well, ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion, you put that across the top of the chart. Then below that, you put the five hindrances. You've heard me talk about this before. You put the five hindrances across and you write those down. So that would be lust and greed, hatred and aversion, and then sloth and torpor, and then restlessness, guilt, remorse, and doubt. So you put these five and the four are above like this. And then you, you look at the way these are relating to the four. Then it gets more interesting because you can go to a total of 11 different suttas in the Mahab, in the Majima Nikaya, and put what all the different hindrances they talk about, 11 in one place, 16 in another, 12 in another, five or six in another. And you have this big chart and you try to see how many of them actually go back to those seeds. So I'm guessing here, but I'm guessing he understood that when he was teaching him uh, to practice the Brahma Viharas, he was teaching him as a continuation from the lesson on the elements. He was teaching him, now you're, you're going to let go of the seeds of the problem, and you won't even have to have a way around them because you'll, you'll let go of them completely. So that could have been the case. It's a very interesting thing to consider that, and you have to map it out for yourself. Then the breathing becomes the great stabilizing practice for life. Whenever and wherever you need to calm down very fast, stop, take a breath, breathe. Yeah, and get a rhythm going, and your blood pressure will just come right down, <laughs> just like that. And you'll put the hammer down, and, this, and the computer will survive. <laughs> Except I didn't have a hammer, I didn't. But if I had one, <laughs> no, 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 I'm only kidding. <laughs> but it was enough to really get me. <laughs> okay, once his mind abandoned immediate thoughts and reactions containing ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion, his meditation and his life became easier. And he left to become a teaching monk. That's the end of that story. Now, see, that's just in the front of this, and I don't know if it should be a chapter by itself, but it's really all about the basis for why it's going further now. So we don't have names for these chapters, by the way. So anybody wants to get involved with this, I'll send you a copy. You can tell me what the names are, because I haven't done that yet. And I need somebody with a sense of humor. <laughs> Okay, so just as in the past times, it is a shock to us when we realize our time on earth can be like heaven or hell each day of our life. The older we get without knowledge and wisdom, we find there can be sudden and great suffering to happen when it is least expected. And this can be of a great shock for our system. But if God, had made us in his image, as many believe, then this all-knowing being must have provided us with some kind of knowledge about how to deal with such situations with a clear mind. I am still waiting for mankind to figure this out. And I'm just doing that as an old, uh, referring back there because I'm an old Christian for 50 years before I was a, a Buddhist. But that's the basis is he must know, he must have done it for a reason. We must be the way we are because for a reason. And there must have been something, one of the funny ones, uh, simple ones really, is everybody has holes in their eyes. And I would say, why does everybody have holes in their eyes, mom? And she would say, because everybody is going to go through pressure and uh a hard time in their life, you know, everybody is going to go through a pressured time. And those are your pressure valves. 
So it's like men and women should be able to cry, not just women. It's important we understand that piece. Okay, where'd we go here? Where was I? Mm, okay. So because it is not immediately evident to us that we have anything to do with creating our own experience in life, we remain blind to the truth of how transient and impermanent any state that we experience in our life can be. We experience suffering until we realize we can change our perspective and how we can look at things and how that can make a difference. You know, the old saying, you are what you eat, right? Well, the Buddha taught us that life experience comes first from what we think. And so I suppose we could say, you live what you think and what you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. I say this because in a conversation one time, Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Lord Buddha, where is the world? The Lord Buddha replied to him, Ananda, the world is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. That's all. And they had this huge world around them. And he says that to him. But right there, I heard him tell us the whole perimeter of the Buddha's entire teaching. Because I have to find that statement. I know it's in the Digha Nikaya. And it's, I think it's in the Parinibbana Sutta. But I have to go check it. He told his monks, be careful, monks. That which you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. You can find that one in 19 section 11 of the Dwayta Vitaka Sutta. So how does this all work? Today, science has pretty much proved this statement to be true, that what we think and ponder becomes the inclination of your mind. We have uncovered this. Allow, although we are born to be in charge, we just don't know it. And scientists have connected research on the development of new neural pathways to the brain and behavior patterns. Google, if you Google that and see what you come up with, therefore, this, this line right here, um, the development of new neural pathways, I probably should make it dark, huh? That one right there. Uh, if you Google that, you'll get some interesting synopsises of, of what they did in the research and what they found. Mind is the forerunner of all states, says the Buddha. Mind made are they. And our actions follow the direction of our thoughts. This is what this means. And Dhammapada, this is the very first verse, very first verse that you have in the Dhammapada verses. It then becomes obvious that we are the ones who create our own perspective, how we see things and choose how to interact and take actions. The way we see things happening, our perspective leads to intentions and action in our daily, in our day's reality, and then to further results that might bring pain to us, or it could make us happy. The most interesting part of the discovery is that it proves that change is possible. It turns out that we do not, we do have the power to change our perspective and we're the only ones who do. And we, uh, when we do that, we begin to steer our boat more easily as if you're in a boat through going sailing through life. But first we need to learn how to sail. And when we do, learn proper knowledge, we will then begin to more and more in, uh, have, I'm sorry, gain more intelligent control. And we notice that everything occur, uh, around us changes too. We begin to gain. Whoops. I know how to do that. Come on. Now, this could have been what excited the people about the Dhamma when it was first presented back in the time of the Buddha. When people came to hear the Buddha teach, uh, the Buddha teach as a teacher, I honestly think that they came to find something that could lighten their load, giving them some relief in daily suffering. And this was true for me. 
just listening to certain suttas began to change my whole outlook on life. You know, you need to go back and think about who was listening to the, this, this idea came from, it's not an idea, but it's just the picture of who was listening to the Buddha when he was moving the camp around the country. And when you over here in India and you know where he was and how many miles that was at kilometers and everything, and you start to look at the whole situation, farmers were just coming and merchants and shopkeepers and all these people were coming to listen. And what were they gonna get when they weren't highly educated people? What were they going to get out of listening to what he was doing? What were they expecting? They were trying to find something that would ease the suffering and the living here. And let me tell you, we might be in climate change, but you know, I have lived the past week and a half in 39 and 40 centigrade consistently pretty much. And I'm really ready to go to Himachal now, <laughs> up to the Himalayas. And I'm gonna call and ask if I can just go up for a few weeks and 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 maybe, you know right up there because it's it's so exhausting i don't have to walk to get exhausted i don't have to just get up and go to cook to get exhausted if i wake up and get out of bed and feel the heat i'm exhausted it's so oppressing because even if you say well turn a fan on i tried that and i figured it all out i do these dissection things i try to figure out this and it's absolutely equal to the low temperature that's on a dryer for clothes. So it'd be like sitting in your house inside a dryer. That's how hot it is. And if you don't understand that concept, try this one. Sit on a chair at from about 38 or 39 to 42 centigrade. Sit on a chair and just take a spoon of water and put it on the floor in front of you. And you can sit there and you can watch it evaporate. That is too hot. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just too hot. The Buddha taught an ultimate goal or objective to reach a supreme and final escape from suffering and then continue to complete living out your last round of life here and now. That's what happens to the Arahat. He doesn't disappear. He doesn't not ever get sick. That's the other illusion. <clears throat> we have all these accounts of the Buddha arrived, but he wasn't feeling well. He is over here and he's got a stomach ache. He's over here and he has a backache. So let's not deceive ourselves about these things, okay? A goal remarked uh, to uh, being achieving the objective would, um, you would completely and forever get a person off the wheel of suffering called, um, Okay, they remarked there was a goal of, of stuff. I have to look at that, okay. Called the wheel of, of samsara, which was an ongoing recurring cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. And this is the whole thing he's talking about, but reaching nirvana doesn't cut you free from that. You still have to reach the end of this life and you have to go on with whatever you're gonna do. Doesn't mean you're not gonna retire and go in a cave until you're finished or a person might decide to tell jokes until they die, or somebody else might teach until they die. But we have a lot of what happens. Why, why do these older monks, which I'm beginning to be, <laughs> um, why do these older monks insist on, instead of going, going back to getting into a, a, a quiet elderly community, <laughs> uh, which my friends have done in the, that I grew up with, <laughs> Why would you just stay here and keep teaching and move around every couple of months and live in another spot and teach people when they ask you to and stuff like, what are you doing? I can't really explain it to you unless you start to experience this for yourself. But when you get into the Dhamma and start understanding it, it's exactly what it says it is about the Sanditiko, Akaliko, Epasiko, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Webitabo, Manuiti. It's like, you know, when it, we say that, we hear that in the services, but I never really knew what it meant until I felt this movement inside once because I stopped for a couple months. I was sick. And when I came back, I was starting stronger. And I went, what is happening? Why would I be starting stronger than I stopped? 
And looking at this, looking closely at it, inside us, something starts to move. Something is moving towards something, and it's moving towards the total complete opening of your mind. And then you being able to hold that state or let it rest there and not disturb it with, by putting back what? By putting back any past um, events that you're constantly replaying or by not putting anything about worries, worries, worries in the future, understanding that the present time, really, really, really understanding the present time is the only place that you or I am alive. We are not, we cannot to right now say with a memory of the past, be alive in the past. We cannot do that. We cannot be alive in the future. It isn't here yet and you don't know what it is. So the, the thing is, it being in that position, once your brain starts to pick up on that, something is helping you to move in the direction that you've been trying to make it understand, hey, brain, it's more comfortable if you stay on the wholesome side. It's more comfortable. You don't have to rebuild the apartment up here. <laughs> you don't have to change or redecorate. Everything can stay the way it is, and you can continue to work, but I'd like to work with you now instead of feeling like your brain is doing one thing and you're trying to do another as you go through life. And that was frustrating. Feeling that way was really frustrating. The description of that accomplishment, the, the highest accomplishment can be described uh, in the often taught phrases of um, accomplishing uh, a remainderless, they say, they call it this way, a, um, a remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering. That term is not the fading away and stopping of suffering. It's not the same thing. It's the remainder, fa remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering is different because there's nothing left. And you remember in lots of suttas that we read over the past year or so, or a couple years, we have always heard about this extirpation, extirpating uh, something is pulling it out completely by the roots so it can't grow back. But it isn't torturous. It isn't hard to do that. You just need to know how to do that so the plant doesn't the weed doesn't keep coming back and coming back and coming back. If you're a gardener, you know they have all different kinds of tools you know to hold and, and push down and grab the bottom of a weed and get it out completely so it doesn't germinate and make more and more in the garden. So anyway, this part comes out, this idea of the remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering, it comes out in the Dhammachaka, uh, Dhammachaka Apavatana Sutta, which was the first sutta the Buddha taught, and also it's called the turning of the wheel. It was the beginning of his teachers, and you can see this. I gave you a little address where to go to Sutta Central. And now this, it, here it is exactly. Now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving and the giving up of clinging. That's the last word that should be there. Whoops, that's not where it should be. <laughs> Sorry, whoops. So there would be no more earthly lives, full and uh, full or uh, repeated suffering once that final attainment occurred. And that is what the wheel of samsara is about. That This is true. However, the Buddha didn't teach only that end result. This is where this begins to get interesting. The Buddha left, whoops, right, right, sorry. It was an easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection, and it would not be changed at time. Oh, I'm sorry. Where do we go? Right. The Buddha left for all humanity something really precious. And the reason I wrote this booklet is simply because 
it was left for you and me and all average people can learn enough of it to find some relief from suffering in this life. This is not something for just the academics to have or those who learn Pali and can only read it in Pali. I can guarantee you this, the Chinese are not reading it in Pali. Neither are the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, the Burmese or the Thais. I can tell you that right now. The common person is learning it in their own language and there isn't any reason why an English speaking person can't learn Buddhism in English. Then there are those who will go further to study the Pali and that's really good, but it becomes dry if you do it sutta by sutta by doing that, unless you can see how it works in life and actually works in life to help you. You can't get the real, the real lesson all the way through. It was easy to understand. The thing was, he said, um, it, it's, uh, it was easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection, and it would not be changed by, uh, by time. And the practice is what helps the person reduce the daily suffering day to day. It's the only way you can train your, your brain. You can read the whole entire Tapitaka and not understand Buddhism and not understand what it actually could do and not understand why the people supported all those monks all those years and supposedly supposed to do it today too. You see, you can't understand it. The recollection of the Dhamma, the, uh, the phrase is spoken each time that we attend a service in the Buddhist temple. It's one of the most familiar recollections anyone can talk about. The Swakato Bhagavata Dhamma Sandatiko Akaliko Aipasiko Panaiko Pajitang Veditabo and Nuiti in, in the service. That's what they're doing. Well expounded is the Dhamma of the Exalted One, directly visible, immediately effective here and now, calling to you to come and see, leading onwards. That's that movement inside you to be personally realized through your own knowledge and vision and your practice, okay? So this is where I went through the first chapter and I just wanna know kind of how you feel about it. it this is gonna keep, keep going in the next chapter. What happens is it starts to go in the unique teaching is supported and then it starts to go into more and more and it keeps working out this whole thing of how the suffering as it goes in, but we can go, you know, lesson by lesson, or I can send it to you and you can look at it. But I wanted to open the floor to you, understand that when he's teaching, what he's actually teaching, what he's actually teaching is something to be used. He's not teaching something to be read and put away. The most fascinating person I ever met was somebody who brought the regime into kind and say, oh yes, I've read that book. <laughs> They don't practice, but they've read that book. And it was a person who read the top books on the list in Washington, DC always. And this one was getting coming out more and more. Um, I like to think we had something to do with waking all that up. Because <laughs> at the time when we started, nobody was reading that book. And But what's unfortunate for us, I'll tell you what, when, when uh, Wisdom Publications actually had the the contract for the book and the book was quite expensive, like 42 or $50 to get the book. Okay. Um, but it went down in price over time. You could get a lot of used copies and always remember with the Majima Nikaya anyway, I don't know about the other two, Samyutta Nikaya, but, uh, or the Angutra Nikaya can't touch yet, but the way it worked with the Majima Nikaya is um, there were four editions of that book. And so a lot of people would retire in addition and get the new one. But the funny thing was people were not even unwrapping the books sometimes. And you could buy a used copy for $20 or $30. It's all wrapped up, shrink wrapped. It was never unshrink wrapped and it's brand new. And they bought it so they could say, oh yes, I own that book. And they put it in the, in the bookcase, but it was never even open. And I bought a whole box of them one time and took them to the center and gradually we let people have them, you know. But um, it doesn't change much with the additions except refining tiny little points on words and stuff. Uh, and it, what happened when 
Wisdom Publications was bought by another group, they they realized people were getting more and more interested in the book. And now it's, I think, $60 or something crazy. But you can still probably go to them. Uh, my favorite version, I still have one of those. I kept it, was that the book, the book was, the outside cover was upside down on the book. And so they had printed a whole mess of them and they sold them for 20 bucks a piece. That was interesting. <laughs> And then there was another time when there was a misprint in some way. I don't remember what it was, but we got them at that time. They used to tell us. Very good. So this is how he gets into the beginning of this whole thing. And as it goes along, it gets him to the practice. It gets him to understand uh, the pieces. So when I talk to you about the pieces, you know what I'm talking about when I talk foundation information. I'm talking about what is a being, the five aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Okay. I'm talking that way about the being. And it's from the head to the feet is the whole world because nothing is ever happening to you, but you don't know that. Everything in your life has actually happened from your perspective, your decision and choice, subconscious choice. When you don't have the, the education of it, when you don't have the knowledge, it's a, a subconscious choice we immediately make towards the craving and clinging and desire for control and everything. And one of the biggest places we see the desire for control when we're teaching is in the area of the hindrances and really feeling that it's necessary to defeat them, to uh, you know, defeat them, destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suffocate them, suppress them, and subdue them. <laughs> it's like that. Okay. When actually the Buddha gave far more information, that's only noted in basically one sutta as strong as that really strong place in sutta number 20, but nothing supports sutta number 20 through 151 suttas around it. That's the problem. So you wonder why, how did that get in there? We don't know, except um, Bonte's uh, idea, and, it, and I agree with it, is that, that maybe one of the conferences when they were putting the book together again, you know, it is possible. They read the first couple of ways to solve the, the hindrance and they didn't read the whole one because everybody knows that one. So they just kept it in the book. We don't know. We really don't know. It's just a guess. Uh, but the, the really harsh treatment of it by putting your tongue against the roof of your mouth and pressing down on the hindrance as hard as you possibly can is totally in denial of what a hindrance is and how the hindrance works, and what is the nutriment for the hindrance. And if you don't understand that, you're going to suffer a lot with hindrances. And this doesn't matter if you're, you're practicing with us in Brahma Viharas, or if you're practicing breathing meditation, or if you're practicing concentrating, uh, watching a crystal ball until it gets, you know, you go inside it, or using one of the, um, what's it called? where in, in Tibet, <clears throat> using the central piece where you watch the, everything in the picture is made to go like this. I think I can show you one of those. Wait a second. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, no. I don't think I have it. I don't have it. I don't think this is it. I think this is something that somebody gave me that okay, I need to uh, Are you talking about man mandala? Yeah, mandala. mandala. Actually, this one is a beautiful picture of green taro, which... That's nice. <laughs> and I need to give it to somebody who really loves green Tara. They were trying to be very nice to me and they gave me green Tara, but nothing wrong with green Tara. I mean, <laughs> just anyway, <clears throat> there's green Tara, but the mandalas, what you're saying, mandala, right? <clears throat> so the way they're, they built them, they built them in the squares, square like this. And sometimes they're round, but when we were, <clears throat> I forget where we were. We were near one of the temples and a guy had a, 
he had a shop and that's all he did. Bonte and I went in, we bought some for some people that like to sit and see how deep they can go with the mandala. And the game is like, it's a square like this and it's painted so it makes you look very, very deep. You see, very, very deep. So it's a big square to a smaller, 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 tiny little one is in the middle like that. And right inside that's a little Buddha or something is in there or it will be if you keep staring, <laughs> you know, and you just keep staring and staring at this. And it's, a, it's an interesting form of practice because it does let everything go out from the mind. It cannot be done if you're, you're still in thoughts and everything. And most people that practice it in Nepal that I talk to um, practice breathing meditation before they go into this but they say it's a gentle, it's not a hard, hard kind of concentration, but it doesn't go to the answers the way you, you would want it to. You see, I guess we are really wrapped up in the whole thing. I know I am from the perspective of if something you're doing in your practice is working for you. The Buddha spent time discussing this with the monks and if it's working, so that it is helping you to get to path and move down path easily. It's very good meditation. That's what he told Ananda. And then he said, it's the only place that he said anything really about it at all. Good, he said, what is good and what is bad? And, and he didn't say to Ananda, good or bad. He said, if it operates and it allows you to get to path and move down easily, it's good. And then if it's, if it's, it's not good, if, it's not going to help you to get to path if it refuses to allow you to reach path and then go through it gently. So what is it that keeps a person from going down path? Desire, wanting it. And it goes back to, <clears throat> I want it. And the mother says, I'm sorry, you want it, but you can't have it. And that's what the teacher should, we, we say to the person, if we catch them, as long as you really want this, you cannot achieve it because, because it's a desire where I want it to happen. Just the way if you tell somebody to do determinations, and I have tried this out for myself to see how it works with a group of different people. Like if I had five of them, I'd play around with it. I would tell them to say, I want to sit in the third jhana in my next sitting. Or today I want to only go as far as infinite space. Okay, but you say to the other person, I will you repeat this, I will sit no higher than the in, than infinite space today. And they their desire, when they're discussing it with you, their desire is to be able to sit longer in infinite space so they can really examine that level and see what it feels like and maybe how it affects the body and how you can use it in life, okay? For what, what would you use that for? To heal, to heal, definitely to heal because it's an open, it's a, it's a level where everything is leaving you and you are, it's expanding, your mind feels very, very big and wide like that. And it's just the same as third jhana, when you start to lose the, the parts of your body, remember you lose it in your hands first. You can see, you feel it losing in your hands and not feeling your hands or your feet anymore. And then if you're just, you understand that's what, and someone said to me, you shouldn't tell them that's what's coming. They'll come to you and say it came. <laughs> and I said, okay, the next time you go on a long trip, in the United States and you want to drive a car from all the way from Philadelphia all the way to Vancouver, Canada, you shouldn't go to the AAA and get your roadmaps and read about how to get there safely. You should just get in a car and go try and do it without knowing anything about who is fixing the roads or building new roads anywhere. Try to do that in India. <laughs> You can't do that. You better. I have two drivers. One driver, he doesn't pay any attention when we leave here and we try to go to Mumbai. So it takes me two and a half hours or three hours to get from here to Mumbai. 
Okay, but then I have another driver who knows what's happening on the roads all around us. It takes about an hour and a half, maybe two, depending on the time of day. So it's at least 30 to 40 minutes difference in, in how these are, uh, the traveling time, just by knowing about the conditions of what you're going to go through. So by teaching you all the different things about what can happen in your practice, and we are, Bhante Damagavesi and I sat down and we are going to have, um, I wanna have two weekends and I wanna have two days each weekend. Then I mean, I can leave it up to who's coming. We have enough information to discuss by taking them through and through a re what goes happens when you go through a retreat and what are the things you face when you are going to initially sit down, what happens to you in the first jhana, what happens in the second, what happens in the third, what happens in the fourth, what are the places you fall down? And that's what we can get as many people as we can to come but it's like they're only allowed to come in the door if they ask questions. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get them to ask questions. I did go, by the way, one time to, to in Malaysia to a big thing where about 500 people were there. They asked um, 48 questions. Uh, okay, the questions, they were written before they went in the hall. They had to write the question to come in. So 48, that's about one fourth about, of, it was about two, 200 people, I think it was, that was there, something like 200 people. And, um, and they dropped them in a bucket and just gave it to us in the front of the room. And we went through the whole bucket and they, they told them they can't be personal questions or what do I do with this life situation? It has to be about the Dharma and about the practice. And we want you to answer from the text, the solution and what the Buddha would have said is the solution. So it's really very easy to counsel a person that way because you have the Four Noble Truths, right? You have the Four Noble Truths, you have to just listen and find out what's wrong for the person, right? And then you have to listen to what they're saying is happening so you can notice how they are not seeing the cause of what that is. And then, you want to see how they can get out of that. Well, because they didn't see the cause of the suffering, they can't get out. And then you can show them the steps to take, but you can't advise them. We're not allowed to advise them. See, you, when you come to the retreats, even on the online retreat, you're, you run the show. We're just showing you how to sail the ship, the boat better through life but you're the one that is at the helm, you're steering. You are the one that even if you go through a, an attainment or two or a fruition or that sort of thing, it's only as good as you keep it and you protect it and you leave the past and future out of it and your head stays clear. As long as it stays clear, the effects of that, that accomplishment is going to be with you and help you but if you sit there and start falling into, oh, I remember, oh dear, that got in there and the future, what if this happens? And there's a lot of both of this happening now, but we just have to understand this body, this being works the most effective it can when we can let that go and let that go and stay here to do one thing at a time. And each employer out there is going to agree with me on that. And each person who's teaching something is going to agree with me on that. They can't learn piano if they're thinking about rock and roll constantly. You know, there's one teacher in Philadelphia taught him how to play uh, the Beatles and then they'd be quiet and then they could go back to Bach, you know. <laughs> but they have to learn the pedagogy. That's it. And the pedagogy, right? Is that the right word? The pedagogy for the piano, okay? You have to do the pedagogy for voice. You have to go to the pedagogy for piano. If you're playing a horn, you have to work on your pedagogy to stay sharp, you see? It doesn't just happen and nobody can do it for you. That's where all of this leads. So what's on your minds?
Well, I have, uh, there, there's one thing I noticed. Um, this, this may be obvious for uh, native English speakers, but to the, the word want, it's, it's also like to uh, confess you don't have something, right? The word, which is the word? The word want. W A N T. Oh, want. Yeah. Want. Desire. Yeah, but to use that word, it's also to, um, its meaning might also be uh, to say you don't have something. Or it depends to say. On the it's, a, it's one of those words. It's a word that's a neutral word. You put it into the situation to decide what it means. It's like desire in Buddhism. Now, one of the problems we have with modern people is they come to Buddhism for the solution of everything and they get into the issue of desire, okay? And they hear that desire is a bad thing, but then, then if, they're in, if they are taught enough about Buddhist life and living as a Buddhist, you should come to the spot where you understand there is wholesome desire or unwholesome desire. So desire now becomes a neutral, a neuter word, a neutered word or a neutral word. And in and the chanda is that word in, in uh, Pali. The chanda can be wholesome or it can be unwholesome. Because but we have people that look at all of this and say, because desire is such a problem, I should desire nothing. This is where the corruption has happened with the Four Noble Truths. It's a total corruption to say that all of life is suffering. Now, suffering is going on all the time in your life if you want to get dogmatic and get down to the you know, bacteria and the cells fighting with each other and get to the whole entire thing. Okay, but when you first introduce Buddhism, it's not a good idea to say life is suffering. That's not the translation of the first noble truth. The first noble truth, there is suffering, is the proper translation. Suffering exists in life, but it you're not suffering all the time. Any Anybody can see that, unless you're doing it to yourself. You see, you know, and not understanding yet how you're doing it to yourself. But you're not suffering, all of life is not suffering. And if you think you're going to have more Buddhists come to the Buddhist temple, you better not be selling it that way because the kids are not coming and neither are the teenagers. And most young adults have forbidden their children to go to temples where they say, all life is suffering. They will not allow it. When they come back from the West or wherever, they say, what are you doing changing that? Nobody should be touching that. Second one, there is a cause of suffering. That's what the second one is. There is a cause of suffering, okay. Yeah, but nobody ever said the cause of suffering is desire and stopped talking. Now, see, I just kept talking about desire and I defined it, right? Okay, but if I just say to you, and the second noble truth is, the cause of suffering is desire, period. Well, if you say that, there was no reason for the Buddha to come. He shouldn't have even shown up. He was a smart guy. You know, if that's what he heard, he discovered, we're all a bunch of fools and we should a hike. You know, because there's no solution. There isn't any solution, but he found a solution. Then to see the third one in the corrupted version, the, the original one is, there is a cessation of suffering. Now, you know that, I know that. You didn't walk through, even if you're in depression right now, you weren't always in depression. When you were little, you were happy and you were having fun and then you were sad and then you discovered stuff and it was like this and you were learning all the different variations of emotions. But you were not, you were not sad all the time, okay? So what they said for the corruption, you're gonna like this one. The 13 year old girl who came to the temple with her mother, who's a friend of mine, she loved it. You know, I'll tell you what happened. The, pre, the, the monk then says the third noble truth is that the cessation of suffering can only occur if you desire nothing. 
<laughs> well, she sat there and she bowed her head and she leaned over to her mom and she said, mom, I told you I would come to the temple and I'm here with you at the temple. And it's Saturday and they're giving a nice talk but I'm never coming back to this temple and you're never going to take me here again because I'm never coming back because I could have gone to the mall and gotten a pair of shoes. <laughs> That's what she said, but it's simple. Teenagers understand that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard in my life that you would go through life with desiring absolutely nothing shows the ignorance of a person with English as a second language not to go beyond the first definition for desire. That's the problem. When, and I'm an ignorant English person when I try to speak Spanish because I never advanced my Spanish past the first definition for each word I was trying to discover if I did it with Chinese too, when I was studying Chinese, I was only able to grasp one thing at a time. But if you went into any depth, I never wanted to go there. It was too confusing, you see? So I gave up, I gave up. But see, to say, to desire absolutely nothing, tell me now, what have I canceled out? Ah, do you desire to do well at your job? Do you desire to have a raise? Do you desire to have a good marriage? Do you desire your children to do well? Do you desire a friend to get better, to be healthier? All these things are wholesome. And this is part of the wholesome living for the lay person in lay life, but it also goes for the monks. If you walk around with a frown on your face all the time, desiring absolutely nothing, do you think anybody's going to come and listen to your talk or listen earnestly? If you sound very calm, I can do this for you once. I promise next week I'll do it, okay? You should tell everybody to come and I will be very calm. I shall not move my hands and I will speak like this with a lower voice. As a matter of fact, I will sit on my hands so I don't move them. You may choose a sutta and you may submit it and I will read it to you and you will learn every part of it. But I will not have any emotion in my voice. I shall only read it to you, and that is it. Even if you give me a joke, I will say, ha, ha. <laughs> this is not real. This is not living Buddhism. This is, this is a facade thing, something that is not real. And you know what? I got to tell you something. I've been doing this 22 years now. I've been around the world circumnavigating like three times teaching all the way around, okay? I never met a monk once yet that didn't have a personality. Not one time. <laughs> so, so what is this about that we have to do this kind of thing? We should be able to relax a little bit more. I was at a great gathering once and because we were there, because the war had started and everything, um, they wanted us to talk about how we could help people and how uh, this had just, it had just happened, you know, just started, but we weren't supposed to mention anything about the war at all when we did it. And I went, why? Why? You see? But we weren't supposed to say anything because if we even mentioned it, someone probably somewhere would start crying and that would be bad. So what are we afraid of mentioning the ups and the downs of life? Why are we afraid to talk about the goods and the bads? Why are we, are we not confident in our teaching about balance and everything in the universe that we can't talk openly about it? It should be like a think tank right now where I can tell you all the things you're doing wrong and you can tell me all the things I'm doing wrong and I say, okay, yeah, okay, I have to look into that, but not take offense and not get upset because we, you know, I'm trying to help you grow and you, I know you're trying to help me grow, but that just isn't normal in normal people. And that is one of my biggest problems because I spent six years in Washington around people that were in think tanks and those people are nuts. They'll talk about anything. They'll talk about anything to your face when they know that you really hate NASCAR, they'll come and sit in front of you and talk to you about NASCAR racing. You know, it's amazing. 
but the other person goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and maybe an hour later, they're going to go talk to him about something <laughs> he doesn't like. They're just fun people, and they'll talk about anything. So the ideas that come, the brainstorming that's totally open at those dinners and, and those evenings were just something I shall never forget, not ever, because no one took offense at anything. And everybody had this selfless kind of uh, uh, perspective, you know, impersonal perspective of examining and analyzing, examining. That was the game, exa examining. How does this work? How does that work? If this doesn't work forever and ever and ever, amen. Well, then I'm going to say, ah, women. <laughs> What does, do you know that somebody told me that someone in the government wanted to stop people from saying amen in church? I said, what? And obviously they don't know what it means. They don't know where it came from. And it's so silly. But they, I, I just thought I'd never hear anybody do that because it was my joke about amen or amen. Because the little girl came to her mother and she said, mom, why do they say all men instead of our women? And the mom said, well, it's the same reason that we sing hymns instead of hers at church. <laughs> and then the little girl went away. <laughs> she was happy. This is the reason. <laughs> but why would we get all upset about that? Now, see, that joke is probably politically incorrect right now, and I, I could be taken off the air. Probably because it's politically incorrect somewhere. Do you know the most dangerous thing for Bonte Vimal Ramsey and myself? We have not been conscious of speech since before 2000. Now you have to take a look at this to see what it means, but we would say things that we might almost be arrested for tonight, right now, just in our conversation not bad words, just wrong terms. Like I'll give you one example, to walk through a bookstore and see a beautiful woman and just remark to the people who are standing around you, that is the most beautiful oriental woman I have ever seen. You see, that's a geographical term, by the way, Ge oriental and Occidental, <laughs> I'm Occidental, she's Oriental, okay? And, and somebody actually came up to the person who said that and said, you cannot say that in California. <laughs> and they're like, why not? What, did they not go to geography class? Or they're not using those terms anymore in geography when they saw on all of the old maps and everything like that? You can't say that? So what should I say? And you better be careful because we didn't know what to do instead of saying that. I think Asian would have been okay, I think, but I'm not sure. You know, we're not sure of anything. So usually when we travel around, we're just really, really careful not to uh, say anything in a store or a restaurant or a hotel the wrong way, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting. So what else did you think about, Everett? With went, went, the word went. I don't, the word, uh, the word went. So not the past time going. Oh, I'm sorry, went. Yeah. Wait. <clears throat> to, I know this one's in here, right? To want, okay, watch. <clears throat> to wish, wish for, desire, demand, call for, long for, hope for, yearn for, pine for, fancy or crave, hanker after, hunger for, thirst for, lust after, to covet or need, have a, yearn, have a yen for it. That's another way of saying it. And then the second definition is to need, to be in need of something, 
to require, which is how it's usually kind of used. It's not really, it's kind of a late wish, but it's not really a demand like some of the things in the first one, not quite like that, but it's more often used as to need something or just be in need of something, require a glass of water. I want a glass of water, but I would say I need a glass of water all the time. <laughs> Okay, and then the next one is to have need of something, see, which is also more gentle. Um, and then to uh, lack of something so that you're saying want it. And uh, to be without something means you are wanting of something, so you're without it. And to be devoid of something or be bereft of something. So you are wanting. So my husband died and I am very wanting at this time is the feeling is wanting, wanting there. So there's the fine things. Now, when we get into real interesting territory is when we say the word love and we talk to a Frenchman. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience because the French have 11 separate words or 13, I can't remember, uh, of the word to love for each position of loving, they have a different word, okay? So when you say uh, English people, they laugh at us because we just have love, 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 and love, <laughs> you know? And you kind of have to guess where we are. And then, yeah, like that. Are there any other words like that? Probably, but that, that's, that's the one I was thinking of just now because it's such a, uh... Uh, a, a request or um, can be something so so different from uh, saying you don't have something. You don't have something you're wanting. Yeah, yeah. So you are wanting. Yeah. Yeah. And it does it does hook into desire, like it has the word desire in the first part, and it is it does have desire there. Yeah. But if we were to take a piece of paper and look at the unwholesome desires that we're talking about, having to do the desire that exists in craving and clinging and the habitual tendency of taking old reactions and playing them over and over again and continuing to suffer, that's all a form of uh, wanting and desiring, you know, desiring, 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 pushing. One of the places I got interested in all of this with dependent origination, this is funny, uh, when I first started learning about dependent origination is why in the world did they make this thing a wheel? That's before I knew anything about it. But the comical part was I would sit there drawing like, you know, octagonal sized buildings with 12 sides on them and stuff like that. And then I, I made a cardboard one like that and I pushed it across the floor and I went, oh, that's it. <laughs> because it can't spin, it can't move fast. It it's like you can picture your life in something that has flat sides on the wheel going clunk, 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 you know, like that. But here's this thing in your brain and it's spinning at a tremendous speed. And it has to be a wheel, like a cog in a machine that's going just very, 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 very fast. It's not a cog. It's like a spinning wheel, a flywheel that's inside a clock or something, just spinning, 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 you know? And then the f next part of the fascination was, well, on the line of dependent origination, at what point does the energy happen where it will then be possible for a wheel to move? Because what has to happen for movement to happen is heat and then pressure, and then movement. And how does that happen? Just one second, hang in. The dog has spoken, hold on.
I guess this kind of <coughs> wraps it up because I have a visitor who came and I didn't expect so, um, but what I was going to say, Everett, if you have the picture of dependent origination, do you have that? The 12 links in a picture? Okay, so if you were, we've gone over that and you take a look at it, what happens is uh, the, the, anatom the anatomical parts of the body have to do with mentality, materiality, the material part of your ear and the mental part that helps your ear, eye, nose, tongue, body work, okay, operate. Okay, then you have the six sense doors. And um, when the six sense doors, when they meet an object, and then the sense door consciousness arises, that makes contact happen. And then that's all natural part of the body. And the feeling arising is a natural part of the body too. You don't have anything to do really with whether it's pleasant or painful, making it painful or pleasant. If we were to document, you know, to wire you up, we would understand it's part of the anatomy too. So the first place that starts the engine to turn the wheel is craving. And that's the first spot where I get involved. So Atta has a lot to do with this. And when I like or dislike something, that's the jerk that starts the thing. And then when it clings, why do you like or dislike this? That's where the mental proliferation makes another gear come in to go faster. And then when you grab the old habit out of the bawa clink link, if you reach in and pull something out that you're going to do again and again and again, when you reach in and grab that one, okay, <clears throat> that what happens is that um, it starts to spin. Okay, and it moves faster and faster. And then uh, the birth of the action that you chose that you were going to do, then it's full of speed, full like fourth gear, fifth gear in the car. <laughs> you're going down the Autobahn <laughs> and you're, you're driving now fast. Okay, and that's the birth of it. And then the aging of whatever's happening and then the death of that event. So we're having you look at this whole thing in perspective, in relationship to one phenomenological event at a time in your life. So you can watch the movie play and see all the pieces, like these pieces are frames of a movie and understand where this energy comes from. So if you wanna stop the craving and clinging, you have to slow down and you have to let go of it and then it starts to cool down. And we can do this process slowly and slowly. And then each time we do it again and again, the brain slows down and allows us to watch it more clearly, okay? So we can talk about that. You wanna talk about that next week? Cause that's fun to talk about, I always like that. You wanna talk about that? We can do a dependent origination in an hour's time, a whole lesson, you wanna do that? fun to practice that way okay we can and anybody wants to read this thing i can send it to you You can read and just comment back if you want to um play with this thing that i'm writing uh it would help me to get some comments back you know on it but i'm i'm going through right now to get try to put all of the all of the notes in it i decided this is a good time to do this with one of these and this is a good one to try and do it with because as I read it last night, when I read it through, I could see all of them. There's like 40 or 50 of them. And I know where they all are, I just don't tell you. So it's gonna be fun to tell you where it's all at. So I think it's a good exercise, okay? So let's do our prayer, okay? <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you guys next time. Have a really good week. Keep smiling. Give your smiles away. It's the best exercise in town and it's free. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, bye-bye.